Thank Penny, you. I'm the Deputy Director of the Australian Centre on China and the World. Um, thank you very much for coming to, um, to uh, listen tonight to the Australian Centre on China and the World's third annual oration. Um, I would now like to introduce the director of our centre, Professor Jeremy Barme, who will in turn introduce the speaker for tonight's oration. Thank you, Jeremy. Forgive us layers upon layers of introduction. My name is Jeremy Barme, the founding director of the Australian Centre on China and the World. The third oration for the centre um, will touch on a particular aspect of our relationship with China, one to do with partnerships and engagement. Some of you might know that the Australian Centre on China and the World was established on the principle of a kind of friendship and partnership with China that is one that is frank, honest, and open. It's called Jungyo, the relationship of openness. It's been recently touted in India as a way that the Indians have to start thinking about relating to China as well. This is a concept that uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd mentioned in 2008 during a famous speech at Peking University. And subsequently, when Kevin Rudd gave the speech, the Morrison Lecture here at the ANU, in 2010 that created and founded our centre, he also used that concept to talk about how one relates in a vibrant and complex world to the realities of a China that is not just part of our region, but now a global force and a global influence. Um, before introducing Professor Chubb, um, our former vice chancellor and a, a good friend and the person who allowed and made our centre happen, um, I just would note that ANU has had a number of um, pre-existing scientific relationships with China. And I'll just mention one in particular. A man by the name of Wang Ling, born in Nantong in Jiangsu province, came to prominence as a young scholar in the war period. And in the late 40s, Joseph Needham, a famous British scholar, an expert in Chinese science, civilization, and history, worked with Wang Ling. Wang Ling then went to Cambridge, did a PhD there and worked as one of the main research assistants and associates of Joseph Needham as he, as he completed the monumental work, Science and Civilization in China. And Wang Ling is one of the co-creators of this project that lays the foundation for international understanding of Chinese science history over the last really 2,000 years. It's a great pleasure for me as an undergraduate here at the ANU in the 1970s to first encounter Professor Wang Ling, who by that time was working in the Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies in the, what was then called, and we think of it quaintly now, as the Department of Far Eastern History. And he was a research professor there. Uh, professor Wang Ling retired in 1983, returned to Nantung in the early 1990s where he passed away. But that wonderful connection is just a symbol of the types of relations this university has had with the Chinese world. I would also note that our founding vice chancellor, Douglas Copeland, was the uh, last Australian ambassador to the Republic of China in Chongqing and then in Nanking or Nanjing. And he returned to Australia to act as the founding vice chancellor of the university. And among many other things that he did was to create or re revive the Georgie e. Morrison lectures in ethnology. Georgie e. Morrison was a famous Australian adventurer, raconteur, reporter, writer. And a lecture series was founded in his name in 1933. Just this year we've had the 74th, I think it is, Morrison lecture commemorating George E. Morrison's rambunctious life and career in many ways. Um, and so Douglas Copeland brought the Morrison Lecture Series to the ANU, and it's now part of the world that we, in the Australian Centre of China and the world, want to engage with, inhabit, and we hope to establish next year the Morrison Foundation and Morrison Fellowships. We're delighted to have Ian Chubb back with us here at the ANU. It was Ian's... Um, support and encouragement in the mid-2000s that created the China Institute here at the ANU. It brought, virtually brought everybody who works on China together under an umbrella. But the aim of that institute was to create a specific type of study of China. We call it New Sinology, and if you go to our website, CIWANUEDUAU, you can read all about that. But Ian supported those ideas that related to the importance of China at this university. And our particular inflection of that relationship with China that's not just one of trade and commerce and exchange, but one of true intellectual involvement and experimentation and development, part of our history, but also part very much of the future. Ian then was crucial in the creation of our centre, negotiating with the government, Kevin Rudd, Prime Minister and Cabinet and the department, all of whom have been incredibly supportive of our, our venture. And you'll see that our venture is taking new concrete form over the, over the way next to Sullivan's Creek as we create a building designed by a Beijing-based, but New York, Chinese architect, um, and our building will be finished later this year, and early next year we'll um, be moving in, and I hope, well, I know for sure that our fourth oration 
um, CIW oration will be held in our building next year, and I look very much forward to welcoming you all to that occasion. But for the moment, I will welcome Ian Chubb, Chief Scientist for Australia, and I won't go into your CV. Truly one man who in many venues in the world does not need to be introduced, but ANU of all places needs, uh, he requires no introduction whatsoever. Thanks, uh, Jeremy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to be home, as they say. And uh, I thank you for the invitation to um, deliver the 2013 Australia -China, uh, Australian Centre on China and the World Lecture. Uh, my topic is the one that you can see up there, Partners in, Influ in, in Influence, How Australia and China Relate Through Science. And as you'd expect, I hope to do the uh, topic justice, uh, but I don't want to make it appear too simple because it isn't simple. Above all else, what it involves is human beings with all their foibles. And as I uh, know very well, there are many human beings with many, many foibles, but working across cultures, languages, and over distances. So that actually doesn't make it easy. But I uh, uh, propose that it will be worth it in the end, because good science will have, indeed must have, a serious influence on our future. And I think I could also uh, suggest to you, and I guess hope to persuade you, that it is likely to have much more influence when it involves science based significantly, substantially maybe, on international collaboration. So as I go along, I do hope to persuade you that the relationship will benefit from strategic forethought, both to build on and to get the best out of what is a truly strong foundation. But first, uh, Jeremy, let me say that it's a pleasure to be here and even more of a pleasure to see how the centre has developed. I do indeed uh, well remember the days of um, negotiating the arrangements with <coughs> officials and the Prime Minister's office. It's probably fair to say that it wasn't the most difficult negotiation of my life since both the Prime Minister and I and my colleagues here at ANU wanted it to happen. But it's also fair to say that not everybody sang from the same song sheet. It was an important issue for us, by that I mean Australia, not just the ANU. And I also remember Prime Minister Rudd's concept. It was to be a place that studied China and its place in the world. It wasn't about China per se, but about China in a context. And this gave the centre a focus and highlighted the depth. To understand China and its role in the world, you had to understand China and to understand it well. So we were expected to build capacity to learn as much about China as we could and to contextualise it to contemporary times. So accordingly, it was expected to be a centre that drew together experts from other places in Australia and internationally, not just from ANU. I'm pleased to see that that's happening too. Seems that some of my former senior academic colleagues may have put the dummy back where it belongs, having spat it out driven, as we say, by the well-known syndrome called self-interest. But before I get lost in reminiscences, let me get on with the main game and turn to the China-Australia relationship. In the past few decades, China and Australia have become increasingly important to each other. The bonds have got tighter. That's not a surprise, really. There are little indications, like when you think that there is now a substantial Chinese presence in Australia. Mandarin, for example, is now the second most widely spoken language in Australia after English. And the people who speak it are not all products of the Australian education system. Many, are, many of them are from China or of Chinese origin. In the four decades since dip formal diplomatic relations began, China has not only become Australia's large, largest trading partner, but also our most significant single education partner and a growing research partner. The last point in particular represents a scientific engagement that began even before diplomatic relations were established. And I'll come back to that point a little later. Australia and China now share a strong and highly productive relationship in science. And science, I should say that I'm going to use science because it sort of sounds nicer than STEM. STEM means science, technology, education and mathematics. and. Uh, we in the trade that I'm now in refer to STEM to make sure we keep the maximum number of people happy. But for tonight, I'm going to call it science. But I mean STEM. 
So we've had a strong and highly productive relationship in science. It's been built over more than 50 years. Now, I didn't visit uh, China before diplomatic relations were established. I first went there in 1987, and it was clear even then the importance that China put on science and research, on international connections widely, and with Australia too. And they saw that as its pathway to a better future. The universities in China in those days were not in good shape, but the determination they had to change was palpable and to improve. I remember going into a dingy, dusty and dirty building in 1987 with a long, dimly lit corridor packed floor to ceiling with boxes of brand new PCs. They said that they'd been commissioned to develop word processing in Chinese. As it happened, I was back in that place a few months later and that particular task was well in hand. The building was in better shape, but it was still pretty old and shabby. But we were shown a room with a smallish but quite powerful mainframe computer behind glass walls. It was a gift from a Japanese company. They were going to use it to network the campus. A year or so later, uh, they got a bigger computer. It was a bigger gift from a Japanese company. And they had a bigger plan to network the province. And after a little while, they'd done a lot more than that with that computer. I visited a few years ago and I went back to the same place. I was with an Australian colleague and we were shown a number of machines making, as best I can recall, computer components. They were in separate and very clean rooms in a modern building with hatted, masked and overalled staff and students working them. I asked about equipment like that in Australia and I was told by my colleague that we had one in the country. They had half a dozen or so in one corridor in one university. Now, after more than 25 visits to China, I've seen a change that is staggering. I see people, resources, facilities and infrastructures that is at least first class. And in fact, it would be easy to describe the infrastructure as probably setting the world standard in many respects. And the only thing that remains the same is the determination to improve. It's as palpable now as it was all those years ago. And such change and such determination is, of course, admirable. But it can be disconcerting. In the United States, for example, much has been made of the proportion of the Chinese graduating class in a year that comprises scientists, technologists, engineers and mathematicians. As a percentage of the graduating class, it's around t three times that of the US. Three times. And roughly the same multiple of ours. And this disparity was doubtless one of the reasons to cause President Obama to say in 2011, and I quote, the countries which out-educate us today will out-compete us tomorrow. And he'd already said in 2010, and I quote, leadership tomorrow depends on how we educate our students today. And the US response to this, this observation that the... Um, uh, Chinese were graduating something like three times the number of graduates as a proportion of a graduating year in the science subjects, led them to plan for one million more science graduates within a decade, a 33% increase. And they increased funding to develop more, and as they unashamedly put it, better science teachers for schools. And all of that sits within a five-year strategic plan for the development of science education because the countries which out-educate us today will out-compete us tomorrow and they weren't going to leave anything to chance. They saw it and they acted. Now, of course, the US is concerned about retaining a preeminent position and we can't sensibly do that except in our dreams and certainly not in all fields but we can do that in those that we choose to prosecute. And I'll come back a little later to this need for alignment for focus and scale. Ladies and gentlemen, our relationship with China is important to us, and I think I can presume to the Chinese, given the recent growth. And let me be clear, they have more people than us, which is hardly news. More universities than us, it's not news either. And they are developing 
at capacity at a pace that will take them way beyond us soon and seeing is believing. You just have to visit and see what's happening and sense that palpable determination to improve. And probably the pace of change will take them beyond the current big players. Of course you can't be certain, but it probably will, certainly if present um, projections and, and rates of change are maintained. And for us, while we can't do everything, because we are relatively small, we do have some comparative advantages and strengths that are compatible with their needs and their aspirations. And we've been there in partnership with them for a long time, so we know how to work with them. For us in Australia, persistent linkages with a potential scientific superpower are important. To be in a long-standing, a trusting, and a culturally aware partnership is a key. Under those circumstances, we can together mould and share the basis for our relationship. And that's a better and more secure place, I'd suggest to you, for us both than a fly-by opportunistic, purely mercantile arrangement. I did have myself, uh, I wrote a little story in here about some of my visits to the silk market in Beijing uh, to illustrate what I thought about uh, fly-by opportunistic, purely mercantile uh, arrangements. And it goes to the point that the seller goes high and uses every device known to humankind to get you to try to get you to accept their price. You as the buyer bid low, you resist, you pretend to walk away. And then, of course, you compromise at the end of it because you want the ties. This one. Um, you want the ties and they want to sell. So you settle on a price, you're happy, they appear to be, because they wouldn't have agreed if they were not. And then as you walk off, you hear your new best friend using exactly the same spiel to the next foreigner who walks past. And it's an opportunity opportunistic relationship and about as enduring as the heat in a meat pie at the MCG in July. <laughs> but our scientific relationship with China is not like that. It has prospered because each of us brings and has brought scientific capacity of quality and a need to the relationship based on quite different intellectual traditions that come together in exciting ways to create new knowledge. And we've been doing it for a long time now and it's growing and it's not stagnating. Science and scientists have helped us relate country to country in an enduring way. The relationship has been scientifically productive. It's given rise to many exciting discoveries, innovative new products and strategic new relationships. These include the development of the first electricity generating plants to capture carbon dioxide for storage, so contributing to world leading research on reducing carbon pollution from coal fired power stations. It includes clinical trials of potential treatments for diabetes and pre-diabetes conditions. It includes the discovery of biological control agents that have the potential to improve China's national wheat harvest by up to 10%. And it's not just academic researcher to academic researcher. It includes academics working with industry. So the Bayer Steel Australia Joint Research and Development Centre is a world first venture between the Chinese steel company and four Australian universities the University of Queensland, the University of New South Wales, Monash University and the University of Wollongong. And the collaboration is designed to ensure a more holistic approach to research in order to drive innovation and develop new products. And when we think about how our relationship has evolved, there is another important plank that in a sense underpins and in some respects even comes before in a temporal sense, not a literal sense with respect to China. Uh, and that is education. And the connection there is also very strong. In 2012, Chinese students accounted for around 30% of, of, of all international student enrolments in Australia and 40% of all international enrolments in higher education. 40%. Australia places great value on the contribution our Chinese students make to our institutions and to our communities, a value well beyond simple economics. The presence of so many smart young Chinese in Australia helps us to learn about China and them to learn about us and to learn about Australia. An Australian of my age, uh, who was in our education system when I was, saw the students here under the Colombo plan close up and personal. We saw the importance of the learning that comes from sharing a classroom, a tutorial group, 
or a bench in the practical class with students from other cultures. And we made enduring friendships along the way. And it didn't hurt either for some of us to branch out from the staples of lamb chops and mashed potato or Chico rolls to food with real and variable taste and spice. And I can assure you that they're all long-term legacies I continue in to enjoy today. But today's generation of young people will see a different world from the world I saw at their age. But it won't be the insular, even insulated world of my parents' generation that changed slowly over time with mine and through mine and which is now changing at a breathtaking pace. And if the world is to be a better one, then barriers to comprehensive social, economic and cultural understanding need to be minimised. As far as I'm concerned, that will come about, in part at least, if young people are educated together so that they learn about each other while they study physics or chemistry or possibly even economics. It is fair to say, I think, that we've seen what can be achieved through international relationships and China and Australia are now solid partners aspiring for a better future. Both are deeply committed to the generation of new knowledge and its use and education, and that will combine to deliver improved economic, social and environmental outcomes for all. From early individual contacts in the 1960s, and I'll talk about that a little later, China and Australia have become prolific partners in scientific publications, with a wide range of institutions involved and the full spectrum of the sciences. It is clear, I think, that science is a universal language and it's even, it, it, it isn't, it is not even political, although we've seen how it can be politicised. But it is the issues that draw us together. It's the issues that encourage Australia and China to collaborate. And the shared language makes that coming together possible. But why does it matter? Why does collaboration matter? Why does international science collaboration matter? Well, I think it's important to note that scientific collaboration is part of a much broader international effort. It's also important to note that many of the problems that confront us in Australia are global in character. Issues related to climate are not uniquely Australian problems, nor are pandemics, nor are antibiotic resistant microbes, nor is influenza or food and the provision of adequate food, nor is security both for our citizens and nations, to name just a few. None of them are uniquely Australian. No one country can find the way to solve or manage or mitigate any of these huge problems on their own. We cannot, for example, face down bird flu without working seriously with neighbours to our north. We can't do on our own all there is to do about antibiotic resistance, given our propensity to travel and to be travelled to as a country. How could we, to paraphrase Jane Lubchenko from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric, I've always forget one of the A's, anyway, A, um, from, oh, let me call it Noah, from the US, where she said, we have to be able to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. How could we do that without a concerted and coordinated international effort? Not possible. So I think it's a self-evident fact that science, indeed the whole of STEM, will be at the core of many of the solutions to the big problems facing humanity. It will be science that finds the new antibiotic or the new way to treat microbial infections. It will be science that is at the heart of approaches to feed the people of the planet. And science will help us understand the climate and the environment. It will be science that has a big part to play in finding the ways of managing the unavoidable and avoiding the unmanageable. Now I don't, and I'm not one of those who would ever seek to argue that science will be there on its own. But it will be a constant through that range. I, and I can't possibly argue that it will be Australia on its own. But I will and do argue that Australia has, as part of a globally connected science effort will help define the pathways we need to take. And we will be there because we earned a place. Because we were there, we will make our contribution to worldwide prosperity and global security. Science plays an important role in building partnerships between countries that can be sustained. As I said, it's not political. It is universal. And the problems are large and many are global, or at least they cross international borders. 
And it would seem to me to be a pity if we did not use the mag to the maximum extent possible the linkages around the world that have been built by scientists, sharing a curiosity, sharing knowledge, sharing infrastructure, along with a focus on matters where the benefits will be shared, using the linkages to influence outcomes. To understand the links better and to work out how to use them better, the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council has sought and funded a project from the Australian Council of Learned Academies called Asia Literacy Beyond Language. And it will include a consideration of science in diplomacy or science as a part of diplomacy. And that report will come out uh, later next year or early the year after. But the point that I make is a simple one, really. Australian science has been internationally net networked from the time we got truly serious about it, which dates from 1946 onwards. And it was networked because it had to be. We didn't produce our first PhD graduate until 1948. So when the ANU, for example, was established, a fair bit of its early budget was spent either recruiting from overseas or sending people overseas to get the qualification to bring research expertise into this country. Many of those links were sustained over the years, primarily, primarily though not exclusively, with the UK and the US. And while the output from these links, research papers and the like, uh, while the output from these links has grown in recent times, there's also been substantial growth with researchers uh, in many countries in our region. And I think, I'd like to think, that Australia learned a lesson back then, and I hope that it's one that we don't forget. Until we did research on a reasonable scale in Australia, until our universities were expected to engage in the search for knowledge, until we became a contributor to the world's bank of knowledge, we were outside the tent relying on others to tell us what we needed to know. Now, whether or not they did that is time for uh, is another story. But as part of post-war reconstruction, it was quite clear and a clear resolve of the leadership at the time that we should not find ourselves in that situation again. Contribute, therefore, get to sit at the table where important knowledge is exchanged and important decisions are made. Offer knowledge, contribute to knowledge, to draw benefit from the work of others might well have been a suitable mantra for that time, and I think it still is. And we have seen change. Some 35% of articles published in international journals in 2008 were internationally co-authored. Twelve years ago, that figure was 25%. So it shifted from 25 to 35% of a much larger number over that 12-year period. The proportion of internationally co-authored publications from Australian science has risen from 25% in 1996 to 45% in 2009. So our international linkages and the outputs from those linkages has increased farther, much faster than the world average. And international collaboration has grown faster than domestic only research in countries like Australia, the UK and Switzerland. With respect to China, the proportion has remained at around 25%, although we do need to acknowledge and we do need to understand that this is a constant proportion but of a much larger volume from fewer than 3,500 papers in 1996 to 30,000 papers in 2009. That is an extraordinary increase in output. And Australian papers co-authored with Chinese colleagues has risen from 4% to 14% during that same period of time. So we're seeing growth in absolute number, growth in output, and as far as we are concerned, we're seeing a substantial shift with more of those papers more as a proportion of the total output being with China than at any time in our history. So the message is clear. Science activities in any country with aspirations for the future will be internationalised, and I would argue at their core. And global presence is, is essential, not an optional add-on. The relationship with China is a part of that. The relationship with China is a growing part of that. And equally, I think, a growing and equally and, and growing a, a, a relationship of growing importance and significance to us. And it began a long time ago. It began on an individual sporadic basis. 
For example, um, Professor Wilbur Christensen, a radio astronomer at the University of Sydney, visited China in 1963 as a guest of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. After that visit, after the success of that visit indeed, a number of delegations were organised. The Australian Academy of Science sent a delegation to China and a reciprocal delegation was received in Australia. And a group of Australian scientists attended the 1964 Peking Symposium. So this period also saw the beginning of temporary researcher exchanges. Two Chinese astronomers visited Australia for six months and Professor Christensen spent a sabbatical year in China in 1966, assisting with the construction of a radio telescope based on his previous work from 1963. But like many worthwhile relationships, what began as ad hoc meetings and arrangements have moved towards a more formal, mutually beneficial union. And the relationship continues today. For example, Chinese and Australian engineers and scientists are collaborating on the technology for uh, both Australia's part of the Square Kilometre Array radio telescope in Western Australia and China's new FAST telescope to be built in southwest China. But what's happening, and in a way what began in radio astronomy, is also happening in other fields. And the pace of change is unnerving for some, as I said earlier, disconcerting. But I would argue that it's an opportunity for us. China is moving up the global ladder in terms of the number of research publications. It has overtaken the United Kingdom as the second ranked country in scientific publication output. And on current trends will probably overtake the United States by the end of the decade if those trends continue. China is also collaborating more with other nations and even more so with Australia. Between 1995 and 2010, Australia-China collaboration grew faster than China's overall collaboration with the world and faster than China's collaboration with the United States. There are now 885 formal university-to-university -university partnership agreements in place to support exchange and cooperation between Australia and China. It's a good job they've got a lot of universities because we've only got 40. And if I divide 885 by 40, that means we've all got a large number. Um, but anyway, it's 885 formal university-to-university -university partnership agreements, which is 72% more agreements than just a decade ago. It's a situation now that for the first time, the number of agreements with Australia, with our agreements with uh, China, outnumber US-Australian agreements. Some 2,000 or so Australian students travelled to China to study in 2011. And three universities, Victoria University, University of Technology, Sydney and Monash, have established joint campuses in China. In several fields of research, such as mathematics, engineering and chemistry, China is now Australia's leading partner in collaboration. That would never have even been guessed at a decade ago, that in mathematics, engineering and chemistry, China is now Australia's leading collaborative partner. And it's the second top source in agricultural and veterinary science and in immunology. But as they say on television, there's more. Joint publications with China in more than half the subject areas examined have an average citation impact uh, higher than that for all Australian publications in the subject area. So in other words, a jointly bylined um, article with a Chinese author will have an average citation impact higher than the national average for us. The China-Australia science relationship has been based on mutual benefit and surely that's the right way to go. How do we identify the areas where we want to work together, put the processes in place, share the know-how, and both get the benefit. As it happens, Australia and China appear to have complementary research foci, and we do share some research priorities. We both have concerns related to, and I stress but by no means confined to, issues like adapting to changing climatic conditions, meeting the healthcare needs of ageing populations, <coughs> issues related to the environment, energy and food security, future economic directions to build and sustain prosperity. And elaborating on what I said earlier, I believe that we need two approaches to our international collaboration. One approach is to align with shared challenges so that we can ensure focus and scale. 
The second is to ensure that individual researchers can participate in projects with colleagues that might arise because of shared curiosity about a particular issue or topic or concern. Now, example of the, an example of the first approach is the Joint Research Centres Program, or the JRCs as I'll call them. These are virtual centres that link Australian and Chinese research institutions conducting a portfolio of research related activities in a specified field of research. So there's a JRC, JRC for energy that will develop advanced energy technologies for improved energy security and reducing CO2 emissions by both countries. The JRC, JRC for light metals will develop revolutionary lightweight alloys, al alloys and advanced manufacturing processes that will ultimately lead to greener, cheaper transport systems. The JRC for wheat improvement aims to achieve major technical advancements in grain quality for wheat improvement. The JRC for uh, Minerals, Metallurgy and Materials, the 3M Centre, aims to facilitate Australia-China collaboration for excellence in minerals, metallurgy and materials, as you'd expect from its title. The, um, I must have missed that one. The uh, JRC for river, river Basin Management aims to increase water productivity, food security and economic returns while protecting water ecosystems. And the uh, ANSTO, Australian Nuclear Science Technology Organisation, and its partner in uh, China, SINAP, JRC on development will develop materials that will lead to zero carbon emission technology for power generation and hydrogen fuel, fuel production. So these joint centres were announced during the visit to Australia last year by then State Councillor and now Vice Premier, Madam Liu Yan, uh, Yandong. Examples of the second approach, really a hybrid of the two approaches I mentioned, are the visits planned and supported by the Australia-China Science and Research Fund. By next year, we'll have supported over 80 Australian research groups to travel to China. Two groups of mid-career researchers to China and two groups to Australia. One knowledge exchange symposium and two Australia-China Science Academy symposia, one in Australia and one in China. So all of this is good, all of this is worthwhile but all of this will not be enough for either country. What we need to do, both of us, both nations, is to ensure that we have sufficient alignment, focus and scale in order to increase the level and impact of the Australia-China collaboration, to get more influence, if you like, from the partnership. China has already acted in order to prepare a future more dependent on, for a future more dependent on science and technology. And this important partner for us is continuing to develop its capacity in science and technology to provide a strong knowledge base to secure a prosperous future for its citizens. China took action in 2006 by adopting a new science and technology development goal to 2020, covering agriculture, industry, high tech and the generation of new ideas. It adjusted its science and technology strategies to align them better with the overall national strategy and the goals for economic and social development. So those strategies sum up the contribution of science and technology thus, and I quote, the advancement of science and technology is the radical motive of social and economic development. Scientific innovation will accelerate the transformation of economic development, which is the first priority of the national strategy. And the third one is science and technology are not only about knowledge and skills, but are also closely related to the national culture and spirit. The scientific spirit and qualities of a nation determine the future and vitality of the nation. What these statements indicate to me is that there is an understanding in China about what the consequences are of not taking strategic action now. The development of China and the role of science, technology and innovation is not being left to chance. It says to me that one of our most strategically important collaborative partners is taking urgent and planned steps to improve their skill and knowledge base in any or all of science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And we have a choice in Australia. We could also choose to be strategic. Like China, we could plan to equip our education system to prepare the increasingly STEM dependent workforce of tomorrow. We could plan to ensure a steady flow of new ideas. We could plan to align research and innovation with areas of comparative advantage and national need. We could plan to strengthen 
international alliances. Now, as it happens, I recently laid out the case for such a strategy in a position paper, which if you really want to read, it's on the Chief Scientist website. It proposes many key actions, and many of those key actions are shared with other countries who are in the same business. Thinking about how you prepare a country <coughs> and its people for a future which is on the one hand unpredictable, but under the unpredictableness of the detail is the fact that all of them say science, technology, engineering and mathematics will underpin a lot of our capacity to secure that future, to be the future that we want, the future that we ourselves would be comfortable uh, having. And we have produced that uh, strategy or the proposal, the approach to a strategy, starts with education, we've made comments on that, goes through research, because one of the key issues that you find when you look at what other countries are doing, from China, the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, that amazing federation, Switzerland, France, Japan, Indonesia, India, one of the things that they talk about, two of the important things they talk about, three of the important things they talk about, <laughs> education, critically important, getting the right people in the right place at the right time to teach our young people in a way that they are inspired by the awesomeness of science. They want to be part of it. They don't think it's too hard, turn their backs on it and say, oh, well, you know, it's for somebody else to do. We as Australians can't run around saying, well, we've got to this point, all right. So why bother about tomorrow to look after itself because the past did. We can't do that either. We have to take a different approach. The second thing they share is the search for new knowledge. There isn't one of them that doesn't put an emphasis on the search for new knowledge. And most of them will do what I think we too need to do to get the use of that new knowledge much better and much better integrated into our system. And they are taking steps to do that. We should take steps to do that too. But one of the interesting things about how you see these various countries, the ones I listed and others too, that overwhelmingly the bulk of them talk about the generation of new ideas as a critical element preparing for that future. Because their argument is a simple one, more often implicit than explicit, so I'll explain it as I see it, and that is that without an idea, what can you innovate? If you don't have the knowledge, how can you take it to another stage? So it's an important underpinning for the whole process. And then, of course, you've got to actually have a way, a mechanism, an encouragement, a culture that enables companies, businesses or individuals who want to take that knowledge and turn it into a better product or a service or whatever it is that comes out of that. You have to have a way where the barriers are few and low. Prudent, rational, but low. Low enough to enable it to happen. And we need to be able to do that in this country too. So part of what we did is to propose that we should have a strategy. Included in that strategy is a, an emphasis on the need for international collaboration, which would come no, as no surprise to you. But in particular, we have proposed that we set up, or Australia explore the setting up, because we can't do this alone and we can't go into negotiations with a predetermined position, but we explore the establishment of an Asian area research zone in order to get coordination, cooperation, coherence, a systematic approach to things like the development of infrastructure, shared infrastructure, you know, how many synchrotrons do we need in this region? Um, probably none of them suboptimal, all of them suboptimal in some way or another, either through age or through, through um, um, you know, still in a sort of development phase. How many of those sorts of things do we need? How do we get our young people who have been educated together to do research together, to seek to innovate together, to take the steps that we need to be able to take? And in order to do that, I think when you look at what the European Union does with its research zone, and you see quite a different approach to the way they're now doing it. Because they know without taking an approach it won't happen spontaneously. 
because of some of the foibles that I referred to earlier in human beings. <coughs> so they're actually taking steps to encourage it, to, to excite people about the opportunities and the inventions. And I'd like to see us at least have that discussion in our neighbourhood, uh, that we should have an Asian area research zone to get maximum benefit from the investment that each of our countries makes in people, in facilities, in infrastructure, to get that up and working optimally. To me it makes sense and as I said it makes sense also because um, many of the challenges that confront Australia are shared with our neighbours and uh, of course are shared with China. And it's obvious as I said earlier that solutions to those challenges have got also to be shared. Sometimes they will be on a bilateral basis, sometimes on a multilateral basis. It's up to us to work it out, it's up to us to take some steps to see if we can work it out. Of course, uh, in our proposal for a strategy, the Asian Area Research Zone is one of many key actions contained in the paper. And it's important that none of them are read in isolation. I have to keep reminding people who send me sometimes unusual emails. Um, but that's the point of having a strategy, is to guide Australia's science enterprise, and the whole of the science enterprise, education, research, innovation, and our fourth one is influence. Uh, and it must be done in its entirety. Australia can build capacity if we commit to a strategy. This becomes even more important when we hear that the resources boom is coming off the boil. Our relationship with China will enter a new and different phase. We will need to start now, right now, to work out how to build from the base that has been constructed by all these people over all these years. All our predecessors, all my predecessors over all those years have given us a foundation, it's now up to us to build on it. And if we have a strategy, as China does, we can be partners in influence. We can change the way we do what we do and how we think about the important issues that we need to be concerned about. We can find a, ma a way to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. We can help find the solutions we need and together we can influence how the world thinks on important matters that have science as their base. And it seems to me that it would be a pity if we don't use to the maximum extent possible the linkages around the world that have been formed by scientists, sharing a curiosity, sharing knowledge, sharing infrastructure, along with a focus on matters where the benefits will be shared. And that with China is surely what we want, a real and effective partnership between friends and colleagues, a partnership that has some influence. Thank you. Well, some things will always be more difficult than others. And, uh, but I think that the um, way in which we should be approaching a lot of those issues, especially the difficult ones, is because we've built up a relationship where there is a sort of trust and an understanding and, and all of the sort of issues that you can wrap around that in order for people to get in a room and discuss matters that are sometimes quite difficult to discuss when you don't have that sort of relationship. So my thesis is a sort of fairly simple one. You build up the relationship, you, you build on the platform that's been started, uh, started in 1963. You build on that, you increase the level of understanding, you increase the cultural understanding, you increase the level of trust, and then you can address some difficult issues 
that are important for us to, to consider uh, and indeed for the world to consider. And some of them might always be so difficult you can't actually work with them and you can't, you know, they're better to sort of be focused or, or differently focused. And Australia is probably not big enough to do a bit of everything with everybody, so we do need to be strategic in how we approach uh, some of these sorts of issues. So there might be things we do with some countries and not others for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that our resources are already spread pretty thinly and we need to get focus and scale or focus and alignment at least uh, in Australia. So, so I, I think that, um, you know, as part of a, part of a process of engagement, um, you work out in a serious way between people who understand each other, what you can talk about, what you can't talk about, and over what time frame can you begin to talk about things that today might be difficult. With respect to mathematics, it might be, well be true that you're the only mathematician in the audience, although there's one up there. <laughs> so um, you've just doubled your percentage. Um, the, uh, uh, but I think, I think the, the point that we need to take in Australia is that there is almost nothing we can do in science and technology and engineering that does not require mathematics. And the question really in a way is how do we present mathematics to people to get them excited by the possibilities of mathematics rather than, you know, see the back of somebody writing on indecipherable formulae on a, on a um, whiteboard. Um, and so I also have a view that, uh, and you could say, well, why didn't I do it while I was at ANU, which would be a fair question. You know, I could tell you I tried. Um, and that would be a fair response, but not, uh, <coughs> yeah, well, it's accurate. Um, the, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we encourage really smart people to be really turned on and inspired by the teaching and education they get? And how you structure around that is, I think, critically important. And I think that's particularly true for the enabling sciences and mathematics, you know, physics, chemistry, maths, biology and so on. And, um, and we need to think about how we make people understand the relevance of these things to their lives without dumbing them down. And the traditional response when you try to say, well, why don't we teach X in a way that shows the relevance to students who are studying it, then the critics will always say you're just dumbing it down. But we are smart enough, us in this room, to think of a way of doing it without dumbing it down and we've got to make sure we do it comprehensively, not just isolated examples. And then maths will be seen as the platform on which it's all built in many respects. I think that's an excellent and insightful question. I think that um, uh, in the proposal we put up for an approach to a strategy, um, we make the argument that first of all we have to say why we do this. Why does the, why does the taxpayer of Australia or other countries um, 
pay us to do what we do. And, and, and I think that certainly in my generation and subsequently as I've seen it as a Vice-Chancellor in various places, um, subsequent generations um, have confused the difference between the activity as a means and the activity as an end. So research per se, I don't think is an end. I think it's a means to an end and we've got to identify what the end is. If the end is we put it in our proposals to make Australia a better place for everybody who lives in it, who comes here, with a little more detail than that, but that's the, it in a nutshell. Then the question is how do you get from a position of having Australia as a better place for all of us and the researchers or the educators or the, the innovators over here? And our view the, in our paper is that you can only get there if you have a serious social compact with the community where you can on the one hand explain why you do what you do, how you do it, what the rules and regulations and and the sort of controls are, and at the same time what you can expect the community to do for you in return for that benefit that comes from supporting this um, science, and let's call it science for the moment. And in order to do that, um, our view is that you can't without the humanities and social sciences. So if I had a magic wand, or if I were the king of Australia, either one, because the King of Australia would have to have a magic wand, you, 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 I would make some of the things that you mentioned, like the philosophy of science, or certainly the history of science, almost a compulsory subject in our school systems through the early stages, so that when people, when they chose to do science or not do science, they nevertheless had a core understanding of the values of science. So that when they're being asked to make choices between two warring factions on climate or whatever it might be, they don't go in without any knowledge or understanding of why the argument is occurring or all of the sort of incidentals around it. They go in with some comprehension of why two scientists having an argument is a good process of science and not a bad and, and not, not just a conflict. So I think, I think we've got to think about how we, we propose those. Now, I don't have a magic wand, so I doubt that this would be made compulsory, although the national curriculum has got um, some subjects in it, and if they're delivered in the way that they're intended, then, th then it will be a big step forward in this respect. But it is true that we pigeonhole people very early in this country, so that if, if students get, um, say, relatively poor teaching in year seven or eight, They've already tended to have made up their minds so that by the time they come to year 10, they don't do any science subject if they can, and they can avoid it. Um, more take mathematics than the other sciences, but they can get... A, but once they've made that decision, it's very hard for them to cross over back and in either direction. And so then they go out for a job and they've got a BSc with a major in physics or a major in chemistry. And the employer says, oh, no, you've got physics and we don't need physics. They don't see him as an educated person, you know, with a profound understanding of method and evidence and robust debate and scepticism and all the values that apply to all the evidence-based disciplines, not just physics and chemistry, but history, sociology, a number of these disciplines that are sort of built off an evidence base. They provide you with an expertise and an understanding that, that is almost... Of equal, is of equal value to the discipline content that you learn while you're getting that process embedded. So we pigeonhole and we make it difficult for training, retraining, so people to change over. And, um, and I think that there is scope for introducing these things. Now, I come from a generation where we did history of science, uh, philosophy of science, um, uh, compulsorily. And it was taught to us in a way that made it obvious that it was known that we had to be in the class whether we wanted to be or not. So it was boring and horrible. It was only when I grew up, you know, when I turned about 60, that um, I suddenly realised the importance of what I had not understood at the time. And I've become much more interested in making sure that some of those divisions are more porous than, uh, and probably even more now that I'm in this job because you see the disadvantages in not having porous divisions between some of those disciplines where the fertilisation and crossover ideas could be very valuable indeed and we don't get it because we pigeonhole.
is the quickest way out. <laughs> So starting in another position and getting to the answer, um, in the United States there have been a couple of reviews recently about the um, uh, way in which uh, undergraduates are taught. And in essence, uh, the summary, I, I think it's fair to say, is boringly didactically. When you go back and see how school students are taught and you talk to the school students, at least, many of them, not all of them, and of course there are, there are exceptions to every rule that I'm saying and it's not true for every bit of every university either. Um, but, but as a general rule, this, these are the messages you get. When you talk to um, uh, employers, then employers will tell you that the majority of graduates they see are taught as if they're going to be the next generation of researchers. But overwhelmingly they are not. Overwhelmingly they're going into the workforce in some capacity, some sector of the economy, Personally, I think too narrow, too many, too few sectors of the economy. I think I'd like to see science graduates in all sectors of the economy with that broader base that we talked about earlier, but coming in. Um, but prepared in a way that means that they've got options, more options, or, or they see more options than they presently see. And so it is true that during my time at ANU, we developed a degree which was, you know, you had to have a 99 to get in, you had to keep HDs to stay in and all of those. And, and that was very good. And a lot of those people will doubtless turn up researchers because part of the apprenticeship was they did research while they were an undergraduate. But we have recommended, for example, that um, about 50% of the incoming science, technology, engineering and mathematics students should do work placement. This is the national. About 50% should have a work placement in industry for credit for one semester during their course of study. So the industry see them, they see industry, they bring back ideas, they take ideas, you get a different sort of flow. It happens on a, on a small scale now. I get told all the time, oh, we already do that, Ian. I say, for how many? They say 40. I say, I'm talking about 26,000. They say, industry won't do it. I say, we haven't asked, we haven't tried yet. Of course, a company can't do it, a small. You talk to them and they say they will. So we've got to think about how we're, what, what is the purpose? Why, why are we producing them? Now, of course, I'm not opposed to people going into research careers. I mean, it was mine. I enjoyed it. I've seen people enjoy it all my life. I'm not saying that. But, but if it's true that generically you could characterise Australian universities as primarily thinking of students as potential honours students, PhD students and, and in research careers, it is not going to happen. And I think that it's unfair that we do it and that we, we limit options. You've got, to, it, you've got to change in conjunction the attitude that employers have to people. It goes back to the pigeonholing issue. Um, they have a pretty narrow base. A young woman worked for me last year um, with a, um, a degree from... Um, two degrees from uh, Melbourne University. I understand it's a good one. Um, and uh, um, she did a science degree in another, I think it was commerce, not sure um, now, but science degree, she went for looking for a job. They looked at a, a transcript and they said, oh, you've done a unit of psychology, you should be in HR. Well, it's the last thing she wanted to do. But they looked at the discipline pigeonholed. So she came and worked for the Australian Public Service where one of the one of the advantages is that if you're smart and you think sort of broadly, then there is a place for you. And, uh, and she will no doubt be successful in that. And she won't use her content, but she will use the basis that the content deli delivered to her. Evidence, argument, scepticism, hypotheses, regeneration and redevelopment. So I think that um, when the deans of science said they were going to survey all their a number of the graduates 10 years after they graduated to see if their science education had helped them. Uh, I said that first you'd have to t make sure that they understood that it was an education as well as a content. And I think some of those things have just got to be drawn out and made more explicit, more, more comprehensively than we've done in the past. So I wouldn't ask for grossly radical change, but I would ask for a rethink in, in, in appropriate ways to get some of those messages out there both to employers and to our students, and into schools.
Hi, um, my name is Rachel and I'm an undergraduate at the School of Art in the Photography and Media Arts section and I'm planning to take up science communication next year. So this kind of thing really interests me and it was interesting that question before in the about mathematics and uh, that sort of trying to popularise science in a way. So um, my interest is poorly in uh, as far as um, art and science interacting especially in visual arts in, in every respect. With China, uh, would that be more of a challenge because of cultural differences trying to communicate science through art? Oh, I don't think so. I think we've seen, uh, I think you and I, and a visit to um, China a few years ago, saw a lot of, you know, concerted attempts to use art to bring science to the people. And uh, as it happens, last night I was in uh, Melbourne um, handing out prizes to a uh, bunch of artists who had entered a competition set up by the Square Kilometre Array. And what they were doing was trying to get people to um, visually represent what they thought the Square Kilometre Array might do for, you know, astronomy. Um, but, and some of them were just unbelievably, fantastically good. I mean, <coughs> remarkable. But the main purpose of the exercise was to get to a bunch of people who would no sooner think about opening a book on the square kilometre row than they would jump off a building. Um, and they did, because they, and they got 2,400 pieces of artwork in response to this competition. And last night we handed out six prizes. So you can imagine the six were pretty good first, but there was a room full of a couple of hundred people, most of whom would never have heard or been unlikely to have heard about that particular very substantial instrument until this competition started. And it was, it was seriously about communicating science to people who were not otherwise um, engaged. I'm also, as part of our strategy, we're pushing the idea that there should be a much more concerted effort on citizen science in Australia. Um, I was uh, um, really taken by the fact that in May of this year, um, President Obama had a celebration at the White House for what they called Champions of science, Citizen Science or something like that, which was about science communicating the value of people being engaged. And so citizen science is when anybody can see a bird or a butterfly or whatever and take a photograph, interact, get it on the database, talk to an expert, whatever. A whole host of things. And, and there are good examples in this country, and they do range from people swimming in the sea and seeing a jellyfish they'd never seen before, through to a butterfly, through to art. And I think it's that whole range of things that brings communication out there and gets people to think about it more seriously and not take it for granted, as I think we probably traditionally do in this country.